Warming up your car before driving it. Good idea or bad? That's next. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au, the place where Australian new car buyers save thousands off their next new cars. Hit me up on the website for that. A lot of people ask me this question over the course of a year, and I wish I had 10 bucks for every time. Things would be different. The short answer, no, you do not need to warm up your car. If you have a reasonably modern car, say less than about 15 years old, it's an appliance, just turn it on and drive it. The whole concept of warming a car up is a waste. It's a throwback from the 1970s and 80s and previously, but there is a catch and we will get to that. But first, why does this myth persist even today? Basically, in the olden days, before Twitter, Cars had carburetors. Do you remember those? Well, when I talk about carburetors, all of a sudden I feel like some proper old fart haranguing some kid about music being etched on a vinyl disc in a single micro-grooved helix. With a carby, mate, managing the air-fuel ratio on cold starts was a bitch. It was accomplished with a manual choke. (laughs) Can you remember those? The term compromise springs to mind. Engines ran quite poorly until they warmed up. There was a cable that literally choked the air inlet and manually throttled the engine up. The air-fuel ratio went through the roof when you engaged it and you could get high from the fumes. Sort of not recommended, but as a kid, it did smell pretty good while it damaged your DNA. Once the car warmed up, it ran much better, of course, but only if you remembered to push the choke back in. And I'm looking at you, mum. (laughs) With the choke in use, driving was awful. Flat spots, surges, it had it all. Most unpleasant. A couple of minutes of warming up and all that went away. Chokes got better eventually. They became automatic. They used diaphragms and other weird mechanical voodoo to remove from the driver the onerous burden of pushing the choke back in. They were still imperfect, of course, but better. Still a good idea to warm the car up until the auto choke turned itself off. Then we got fuel injection in the 1990s and the management of the air-fuel mixture across the whole range of operating conditions improved. And there's been a continuum of improvement here ever since. Modern throttles, for example, are by wire, and there's a lot of measurement of the inlet air, the metering of the fuel, and the measurement of the exhaust components leading to better control. There are mass airflow sensors now, math sensors, that tell the computer the exact weight of air going into the engine. There are oxygen sensors in the exhaust telling the computer, essentially, how complete the combustion is in the engine in real time. You get NOx sensors for microprocessor ignition advanced control and a bunch of other feedback and control mechanisms that were unthinkable in the 1970s and 80s. So your modern car today, just start it up and drive. And for most people, you know, that means getting in, starting up, putting a seatbelt on, checking that the kids are secure, you know, backing out of a driveway or backing and filling out of a parking spot or crawling out of some underground car park, whatever. It's not very demanding driving off the bat in the context of the loads on the engine. It's not actually like the checkered flag drops and all of a sudden we're sidestepping the clutch off the limiter. Yes, qualifying for that critical lap. Most of us don't drive every day off the bat like that. Motoring journalists accept it. People also say that you need to give the oil time to circulate. Well, trust me on this, it is circulating within seconds. Modern oil is very thin and the whole system is pressurised within a few seconds at the most, even in the coldest conditions. Engines are also designed to warm up quickly, so basically by the time you're at the end of your driveway, the engine is warm enough. The only catch is, I don't think you should thrash your engine until it's at its full normal operating temperature. Metals expand a little with temperature. It's like 22 microns per metre per degree for aluminium, that's aluminium in America, and about 12 for steel. 
two of the most common metals in engines, right? That doesn't sound like much, and it's not, but thermal expansion is designed in in R&D. And the precision parts are designed to be exactly the right size at their normal operating temperatures. And that means that some of the clearances are off just a little in a cold engine. So for this reason alone, I would not be pumping in the big throttle inputs and the high revs until normal operating temperature is achieved. Obviously, if you're in a critical driving situation and you need to floor it to get out of the path of some runaway truck aimed right at you, whatever, do not die trying to preserve your cold engine because when you're driving, priorities are important. What I'm saying is that thrashing a cold engine is, over time, quite a bad idea if you want that engine to last. And aside from that, I guess the only other case for warming up the car is to get the heater and the demister up and running so that they have sufficient time to remove any condensation so that you can see enough to drive safely. There's a very good case for taking a couple of minutes to get that right, because contrary to the old adage, what you can't see will hurt you. But if you are warming up your modern car because grandpappy implied non-specifically that not doing so would just usher in the four horsemen of the automotive apocalypse, then I'd suggest you are on exactly the wrong track. Doing this routinely is a complete waste of time. 